Welcome to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Today, our topic is evolution. I want a refund. So if you look at evolution, there's a couple of different ways you can look at it, but we're going to try our best, and of course, you know, we struggle with this from time to time, but we're going to try our best to stick to this topic as defined, right? So the definition that we have of evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. So, can we stick with that? Can, can we actually stay on topic on this one? I think we can mostly. Um, as you know, I'm not a big fan of evolution. Um, there's always been this statement about God having a good sense of humor. Sure. But it's like evolution is trying to one-up God. Uh, because you look at some of the diversity in the animal kingdom... And even some of the diversity, you know, among humans, it's either somebody has a sense of humor or this whole type of evolutionary path of producing the best of a species isn't exactly going quite to plan. Oh, absolutely. And you think about the that sense of humor topic, and I'm sure we're going to delve into that here in a little bit, but it kind of reminds me of the scene in Goodfellas, kind of towards the end of Goodfellas, when they're getting arrested in the, either the FBI or, or you know law enforcement, whoever it was, was arresting them, and they said, uh, whoever sold you those suits had a wonderful sense of humor. And, you know, they're all standing there in their nice silk Italian suits and kind of gave this look. I, would, I always think about that with sense of humor. So when we, when we look at evolution, are, are there different types of evolution? Uh, I just want it noted there that the shepherd asked 15 seconds ago if we could stay on topic, and then he moved over to Goodfellas. Well. But, um, yes, there are, there, there are various uh, types of evolution. The most standard form which most people have a view about or understanding about is called divergent evolution. Okay. There are two other types, convergent and parallel. So would you say the uh, divergent is what most people associate with thinking about evolution? Yeah, unless unless this is a topic you've actually researched by yourself, the vast majority of people's understanding of evolution comes down this divergent path. Okay. Um, that's... Um, an evolutionary pattern in which two species gradually become increasingly different. So if you want to talk, say, uh, on a large scale, divergent evolution is responsible for diversity of life on Earth from the first living cells. So that's where you've got right from the first cells to where we are now. On a smaller scale, it would be something like um, the evolution of humans and apes from a common primate. Okay. So... You know, that, that's how most people understand evolution. They want to have something coming from something, from one common ancestor, and it's just a case of how far you push it back. Uh, but there, like I said, with convergent and parallel types of evolution, it's where uh, species may split off because of mutation. Gotcha. Because that's something you can never allow for. You know, that's a very random uh, factor in evolution but when it does happen it can split a species in half within a couple of generations as such right and and because we're talking about evolution it doesn't necessarily mean that it gets better it just means that it's changing because there could probably be certain things that you look back at and you realize we've evolved but we didn't necessarily get better and I'm sure we're probably going to get into some examples of that, but we're just talking about that change, that change over time. Most people, when they think about evolution, they probably think about that poster that was always in the science classrooms of, you know, the monkey that eventually stands up, and next thing you know, it's man walking with spear in his hand kind of deal. Right. So in that instance, you look at that and you say, okay, well, that got better over time. But there could be instances where evolution actually changed it worse over time. So it's just, we're plain talking about the change over time. Not good, not bad, just the change. Right. Yeah. And along with that divergent 
uh, view of evolution, I think most people's knowledge of evolution, or at least to something to throw their hat on, is really uh, Darwinism, you know, obviously, which comes from Charles Darwin. Uh, he was an English naturalist, and he stated that all species of organisms arise and develop through natural selection, and that in inherited variations increase an individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. So if you look in when you were mentioning before about, you know, does evolution lead to something better? Well, better is very subjective. I mean, it's really right. that survive and reproduce, which is the aim of every species, and you so, know, so you know, survival could be looked at as, as true, just surviving. We have to evolve to survive. So it might be something looked at that in certain environments, it's not necessarily as good on the evolution side of what we have become, but we had to do that out of necessity to survive. The natural selection process, though, might be a little bit different because if natural selection was there for that quote-unquote survival of the fittest, then sometimes you could argue that the fittest, even though they survived, maybe it was an environmental circumstance that was mitigated to just this small portion of time, and now that problem is gone. Maybe it's a disease, maybe it's an environmental change, whatever it may be, and what if everything reverts back to the way it was before and now we've evolved and now we can't attack that like we did before you follow me yeah um well i mean what a lot of people don't know about charles darwin was that he was actually a creationist prior to visiting the galapagos islands and he saw so many amazing animals insects there that he then adopted this theory that species arise naturally by a process of evolution rather than having been created by God. And this actually took, you know, the focus of his work uh, in a completely different direction. He still had to be very sensitive, obviously, with the church, which, you know, given this, you know, his book on the origins of species was actually published about, I think it's just over 160 years ago, and at that point in time, a pushback from the church was actually quite significant. Yeah, there, there was, of course, with, with him being over there, there was no you know, true separation of church and state. And you go against the church, and that could be the end of you. And so for, for his time, it was quite possibly a career-ending move by proposing all this. Yeah. And... You know, the two varying uh, types of evolution, you know, he talks about in the, uh, on, the, on the origin of species was natural selection, okay. um, which is obviously, you know, affected by environment, competition, availability of food, you know, various factors, and also artificial selection where, you know, there's human intervention, so you talk about selective breeding with dogs or with, um, you know, plants. and Could it know, also lead to, like, human contamination of environment? You know, there, there's plenty of plants and animals both that thrive in their natural habitat, but then humans get involved and, it, you know, it's kind of like the the stay-at-home moms that get upset because coyotes are walking through the neighborhood because there's all these homes being built and next thing you say oh there's a coyote here you know what do we do i'm i'm worried for my little kitty cat or my puppy dog or something like that going on uh, so you have that artificial human interaction with that environment that might cause those coyotes to say oh let me go just wander through the neighborhood and dig through this trash and you know you got the raccoons doing the same thing the good old trash pandas you know they're digging in the trash saying well i don't have to really hunt as much anymore i can just dig through these humans trash right. uh-huh now um <laughs> one of the things i was thinking about when i was researching the topic of evolution was actually uh I guess the constant abrasion between uh, religion and science and that, 
you know, certain Christian fundamentalists absolutely believe the creationist theory word for word. Right. There are others who, you know, like myself, I believe that God created life, but once everything had been created, there was no reason why evolution shouldn't have taken place after that creation. So that's a mix of God and science, whereas you have some people who, you know, just purely believe that, you know, just like the Big Bang Theory, we don't know what happened five seconds before the Big Bang. We don't know what, which came first, the chicken or the egg. You know, we don't, we don't know kind of how these first cells came to be in, you know, out of the galactic soup. Um, and so you've really got three different belief systems when it comes to it. And like I said, that abrasion between them. Yeah, and somewhere in the middle is the answer. You know, and in, in getting getting too hung up on one side or the other, and I you know believe that with everything, uh, getting too hung up on one side or the other is detrimental to the thought process and getting through that. But in looking at like if you look at that creationist theory, you can look at an animal like the giraffe, right? And you know, if you've ever been to one of those drive through zoos or something that has one of the giraffes, I've been to one, there's one here in North Texas, and, you know, the kids always love seeing the giraffes, because you'd pull up, and you know, I have a Jeep Wrangler, and we'd always take the roof off the Jeep Wrangler, and you walk up in the giraffes, stick their big, long necks into the top of the Jeep, and you feed them, and they pet the giraffe, and they get these big, long tongues, but you're saying, well, wait a second, if... All of this, you know, evolution existed, and yeah, you know, they needed the long necks to eat the leaves off the trees. Did they really need the neck that long, or, you know, why weren't the trees evolving to keep growing taller? And if they did, and we had 2,000 foot trees, would we have 2,000 foot necks on the giraffes? Or you got the big fat hippos, it's like, you know, why don't y'all go on diets, you know? Why don't you get on some Jenny Craig or some Weight Watchers and lose some weight? Do you really need to be that fat? So lots of things you could probably argue on that side of evolution and the survival of the fittest. But you can go to the zoo right now and see both of those animals. Yeah, but do you think, I mean, you mentioned about, you know, the tree following a form of evolution where, you know, it made the fruit less accessible would it not have made more sense in terms of expanding the lifespan of the tree for it to make the fruit more readily available so it could be eaten and then come out of the excrement of the animals and spread to different areas? Because, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know, obviously, the genetic programming behind why, you know, an apple tree does what it does, but, you know, if it is relying on birds to eat the fruit and they'll spread the seed maybe wider right than maybe you know a mammal underneath eating it i don't know because that that would be or or did it go so far as well maybe the apple tree doesn't have to produce that many apples anymore because you got the humans coming along and they decide that you know they're living somewhere in new england and now we have this activity that we all go out apple picking and so now we have to go pick our own apples as some kind of a you know, experience now versus just going to the grocery store and getting them, which is, by the way, so much easier. Uh, So now we go out and we pick all these apples. We go home, we eat the apples, we throw the apple core in the trash cans. And once again, here come the raccoons and they're like, well, we don't even have to climb trees anymore. We'll just wait for the humans to eat this. Then we'll eat a little bit of that apple core. Then they go, you know, scatter the seeds, so to speak, whenever they run around. You could look at it that way. Uh... Yeah, I'd just like to point out there that we discussed the evolution of giraffes' necks across possibly tens or hundreds of thousands of years and compared that to some granny living up in New England who's been picking apples for 10 years and whether the tree will actually outgrow the granny's apple-picking efforts. Yeah, now, it, you got to protect those people that want to go out there and pick apples because you know what? More power to them. I'll just go to the grocery store and find my right. apples. Or, yeah. or better than that, it, you don't even have to pick out your own apples anymore. They have them all bagged up for you, and you can just get a bag yeah. of apples. I mean, I remember the days where you actually had to go, and you had to look at each one of the apples. They all had the little sticker on them, and you say, oh, that's a good apple. 
and you put them all in the bag. Now you can just grab a bag of apples. To me, that's kind of evolution, but once again, trying to steer off topic a little bit. Yeah. So. Well, um, obviously, you know, when we talk about evolution, we tend to group humankind separately from the rest of the animals. I think sure. Most people, you know, have an interest in, you know, where man originated from. And then the animals kind of are another group altogether. Well, sure. I mean, we're all egotistical in the way we think. So we want to know where we came from. Right. We could care less about the giraffe or yeah. the raccoon or something like that. It's all about solving our own problem, right? And we kind of ignore some of these other animals that are floating around saying, yeah. well, if we have evolution, what about some of these other animals? Yeah. Because... I'm not a fan of all animals, if I'm honest. And I think one of the uh, better arguments which atheists have overlooked when they confront Christians in terms of, you know, kind of like exchanging viewpoints, they shouldn't be asking how logistical it was to build Noah's Ark because um, you're going to get somebody who's done enough research who can actually work it out that, oh, it could have been done, and blah, blah, blah. But if an atheist asked a Christian, okay, you believe, you believe in the creationist uh, path, why did God create the wasp? Well, uh, you know, the, there's the wasp, or you could argue the mosquito, kind of the same thing. Mm. It's like, come on, Noah, you could have left those two mosquitoes behind. But going back to one of our prior podcasts, you got the ducks. And to bring the ducks up again... You know, I, I believe it was Eddie Izzard that had a stand-up thing years ago about ducks. And, you know, ducks could fly, ducks can be on land, and ducks can swim. There were probably not ducks on the ark because the ducks were just probably swimming around, letting, you know, people, you know, Noah and his family throw bread or whatever at the ducks and say, you know, hey, we're good right here. We, we can stand on top of the ark or we can swim around in the water. And maybe that's part of the reason why yeah. ducks are a little bit on the evil side. <laughs> well, um, I was, I was looking through a whole bunch of animals other than wasps who you know I'm, I have a particular disdain for. There's a whole bunch of animals where you have to question why because these animals are basically a-holes to every other animal and plant and thing of existence. And, of course, we're talking about besides the normal house cat. Yeah, yeah, because you know, we, cause we yeah. all know hey, cats. Cats are bad, but yeah. they they somehow made it through. But <laughs> but we're we're gonna get a little beyond just your normal house cat and kind of delve into some of these ridiculous animals. Right. Now, obviously, this year we had um in our twenty twenty heading for an absolute dystopia in a twelve month period. We had the mention of uh, the murder hornet. On oh the, yeah, on the news, right? That these species were going to come you know they were like three four inches long and big, they could kill big you with guys. one sting now um you have to question again whether this is creationist or evolution you know why this thing why give this thing this much power because there's actually something called a velvet ant velvet ant okay. velvet ant uh which is actually a wasp but oh so, yeah. well, you say velvet ant. Yeah. I think of like, you know, in Texas, we got fire ants, right? Yeah. And so I think of just your your regular old ant. They, they got their little ant colony they're digging and all that stuff. But you're you're saying this is more along the lines of a wasp. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I thought where you were going with that was fire ant. is because when they bite you, you know, it feels like a little bit of fire on your skin. Absolutely. Velvet ant, I thought you were going to say this, if it gets on your skin and bites you, it feels like a soft massage Ooh. or something. Well, see, that could that could be an argument for evolution. <laughs> if, if you covered yourself in velvet ants, I mean, you could get somebody like... Uh, Oh, you know, name a, a famous designer that could create some kind of a jacket or whatever that was made of nothing but velvet ants and just bit you all over. And next thing you know, you're walking the red carpet covered in velvet. Just saying. I mean, they, <laughs> if, if we had evolution, that that could have taken care of a lot of seamstresses. Uh, yeah. Um, well, the reason I mentioned this velvet ant is because the name is a little bit of a throw-off because it's... Uh... 
This ant only actually grows to about a quarter of an inch long. And like I said, it's technically a wasp, but only the males have wings. Okay. And the females, because they don't have wings, look like an ant. Ah. So that's where it comes okay. from. But Makes apparently one, one sting can actually subdue a 2,000-pound cow, which is roughly equivalent to about 13 average humans. Wow. One sting from this ant. So I've got a question why that's existing. Yeah, it, <laughs> and that's... That's a little bit crazy. I mean, in Texas, going back to the fire ants, I mean, we there's all kinds of homeopathic remedies to try to get rid of the fire ants, and there's all kinds of chemicals we put on them. But how have we not, over time, tried to say, what is the purpose of these guys, and how have we not tried to eradicate them? Right. Because if, if they've got that much power behind them, I don't want anything to do with the velvet ant. Well, this is the thing. I mean, even if science had the power to wipe out a very specific species you know say in the insect kingdom yeah uh there's always people who come up with arguments against it there is actually an official wasp protection league okay so uh, those yeah. five people just need to move away cause well yeah who who wants to do that right. there there was a deal and and of course this is one of our you know thoroughly fact-checked deals that uh, somewhere in Florida they were talking about releasing genetically engineered mosquitoes to try to drill down the population of mosquitoes. So maybe we need to get some people on genetically engineered velvet ants and, you know, get rid of some of them. Right. But, yeah, neither here nor there. Yeah. Now, I know your animal knowledge is great. So oh, absolutely. I'm so I'm giving you a soft pitch here. All right. What a fish very good at swimming swimming right well <laughs> there is a fish called the red-lipped batfish it's known for its bright red hooker lips okay um and its difficulty in swimming so here you've got a fish and a, he's bad at swimming a fish bad at swimming. he's bad at swimming it's a uh, fin it's like a politician bad at lying <laughs> Its fins serve as legs, which it awkwardly walks across the ocean floor. Oh, poor guy. Yeah. And <laughs> it, does he get handicapped parking in the ocean? Well, you know, when he's showing up to the food source, you know, kind of like in the SpongeBob era and they're in Bikini Bottom, is he parking in the handicapped spots? Well, his issues don't actually stop there. Oh. Apparently, because the male um, is the one with the bright red lips. Now, in nature, it's normally the female who has the bright, attractive red lips to attract the male. And for whatever reason in this species of fish, why that has happened um, is a mystery because those red lips still attract more males to mate than females oh. to mate. Wow, we we, can, <laughs> we we could have done a whole podcast wow, yeah. on on yeah. those guys. Red lip uh, batfish. The, the Go look it up. Batfish. Go look uh, it up. It, it, is there a fishing industry behind that? I mean, can can you imagine having one of those in your fish tank at your house? You know, somebody comes over and you have a dinner party and you're saying, "Hey, let's all sit around." And you know, behind the head of the table, you got this nice fish tank, and somebody sitting there saying, "What is that fish?" I'm like, oh, that's a red lip batfish. Yeah, that, that is a very attractive fish. You never know. But but then you've got the point. Is they're going to see the red lips. And they're going to be, oh, what a beautiful fish. She's beautiful. But don't no, assume it's gender. No, that's right. And no. and then, then the poor guy that brought his wife along, his wife's going to say, you know, you were staring at the red lips on that fish and you just did not like my red lips. And I put on this new lipstick and... All that and you know, once again, it chalk one up for the red lip batfish and causing marital bliss, right. or or not allowing for marital bliss, I right. should say. Now, the red lip batfish, other than being a bit pathetic at swimming, um, you know, I think it's a good character. You know, you have these funny animals. Well, they look funny, but most of the funny looking ones are pretty harmless. But there's a a bird called a shoebill. Okay. Shoebill. Shoebill. Okay. And it grows between four and five feet tall, right? Wow. Which, when you think about it, it's pretty tall. Yeah, I mean, other than like your ostrich or your emu yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's too a, many that's a, that big. That's a right? big bird. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, he's carnivorous. 
Ah. He eats turtles, fish, and young crocodiles. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how young. I don't know we're like, you know, 10 days old because if right. you're talking like six months, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And it decapitates its prey before consuming it. Does it eat the head? You know, that I don't know. Ah. Only because I just went on one article alone. Yeah. Well, you know, true fact checking from the wolf and the shepherd yeah. as we do. I'm yeah. just wondering if it ate crawfish, does it suck the eyeballs out? when it eats the crawfish or does it just kind of steer away from the classic crawfish I just, I just thought of something what if this isn't a real bird at all what about if i just clicked on this link and it was something like a uh, middle earth yeah, uh, but but it's on the internet so legends, it has to be true. legends of middle earth and this is a bird it was describing but i just didn't read the top part of the screen i don't know i i think we need our <laughs> listeners to, to research this for us right. and make sure this is an yeah. actual animal yeah uh shoe bill s-h-o-e-b-i-l-l a shoe bill is this yeah. a mythical beast or does it exist in nature yeah. it, and is it going to become our new mascot right uh, you know the wolf and the shepherd in the shoe bill right um now talking about where i think if evolution is real has some issues there is a there's a frog called a gastric brooding frog okay and this this frog gives birth through its mouth hmm. so um the eggs get externally externally fertilized by a, by um a male and the female swallows the eggs which then obviously hatches tadpoles in her stomach and then they grow into frogs and when they get to a certain size uh she then regurgitates them well, that's interesting. There's got to be a more efficient oh, way. That, oh, right? absolutely. That That is one of the definitions of inefficiency. That's like 50 years of evolution. That's not like yeah. 5 million years. No There's, kidding. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Uh, evolution kind of dropped the ball on that right. one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but actually, this frog it went extinct in the 80s right now. I don't know if that was because of, uh, you know, effects of humans getting into its natural habitat and you know made it so it died out well, or it, whether it was predators or whether it just went extinct naturally maybe maybe the females just got fed up and they said you know what I, i'm i'm not swallowing any more of this i, I i'm done <laughs> i i don't want to swallow anymore i'm just gonna spit and then all of a sudden they went extinct it's a possibility it, it is possible uh, but apparently i did also read that scientists are trying to bring them back how are they doing that? Uh, getting rid of um, hold like, of the original cells and oh, using kind cloning. Of like a, a DNA, yeah, yeah, yeah kind thing. of dolly the sheep, but instead right. gas um, Jerry the gastric brood and frog. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, uh, good on science for working through that because that is exactly what this world needs right now. Are yeah. uh, frogs that spit out their young? I mean, with the, with all the problems we got going on. Good on science. We we need to pump more research right. money into that one. Right now, the uh, the last animal on my list, on my short list, which I'm disillusioned with, um, I've saved the best for last. Unless, of course, the shoe bill does turn up to be no, some I, mythical I don't bird know. from I mean, Lord of the Rings. In well, which case, with that one's going to be the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got the shoe bill and you got the the, the swallowing frog. I, I don't know how you're going to beat those. Right. Well, anyway, now this <laughs> this animal. I did actually have to go to multiple websites because the first information I read on it seemed so outlandish. I just absolutely couldn't believe it. Okay. And so I checked on, I think it was like four, maybe five different links and it pretty much all confirmed the same thing. Now, so, whether the, so you did a true deep the, dive yeah, fact oh check on goodness. this one. I could write like a group where I'd have to have a peer study to kind of like approve it or disprove you, it. You could get your PhD in this I one could, is what you're yeah. saying. So anyway, there's this shrimp called the mantis shrimp. Okay. Right? Now, at that point, I was all in. Okay, I can believe this. I've looked up uh, freaky... Um, freaky animals. Fre freaky evolved animals kind right. of thing. Anyway, and this, this is quite high up on every single list. Anyway, the mantis shrimp. This crustacean has spring-loaded punching arms that strike with over... 200 pounds of force wow now come on all right 200 so, pounds so right? basically you have an mma shrimp is what you're talking about yeah i mean but, i mean this dude but 200 pounds yeah, that's the pressure a lot. that's a lot 
from eight but even if it's spring loaded i mean 200 pounds of pressure for like now i guess if it means on the tip of the but surely it would snap off yeah and, I, I mean that that would be terrible if you're eating these in a shrimp cocktail and you grab a hold of one and it pops you in the finger i mean that that's going to end a, a nice dinner at red right. lobster if they right. get those confused now as unbelievable as i found that first fact that was only the first half of a sentence. Let me read you Ooh. the entire sentence. Oh, yeah, do tell. This goes from a leap of that first part of the sentence where you're trying to break it down into pounds per square inch, if that's what it's talking about, in terms right. of, like, uh, force. Whereas the second part... Wait for this one. So, mantis shrimp. Crustacean has spring-loaded punching arms that strike with over 200 pounds of force momentarily... Heat in the water to nearly the temperature of the sun. Ah, well, that's it, that is a hundred percent believable. X Men shrimp. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah what is it, uh, Professor Xavier, whatever? <laughs> that it, it, I mean, why didn't he just have an army of mantis shrimps go take care of everything? You just get them out there, and like dur, 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 you know, punch, 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 punch. Oh, heated sun, heated sun, and every everybody just boils and burns up. But honestly, uh, momentarily heat in the water to nearly the temperature of the sun. Now, do you know what the temperature of the sun is? Uh, I'm going to say it is higher than 120 degrees. It is higher than 120 degrees, yeah. It's actually 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or 15 million degrees so, Celsius. So I wasn't wrong. So if you have uh, a shrimp arm, a spring-loaded shrimp arm, and you hit that water with 200 pounds of force you can almost get up to that 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or that 15 million. So it, it kind of goes back to that article I read a long time ago, and of course I don't have the facts in front of me, but they were talking about cooking a chicken, and you could slap a chicken something like 36,000 times and actually cook it. So does that mean a mantis shrimp could actually smack a chicken once and cook a chicken? Talk well, about evolution. We we have just evolved every chicken restaurant. You don't need ovens anymore. You just get a mantis shrimp. The mantis shrimp walks up, punches the chicken. It immediately gets cooked. Fresh chicken. Boom. KFC, I just solved all your problems. Well, you're saying this. Now, you know I'm a big fan of Martha Stewart, just as she's oh, a big yeah. fan of mine. And um, I don't think even she could work out what the appropriate length of time to cook a chicken is at 15 million degrees cent Celsius. Oh, it, all you need is, what, like a one millionth of a second? One millionth of a second? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's my math brain going right there. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure right. I did all the numbers. Well, apparently, and I think their PR team for the mantis shrimp has been working overtime. Um, well, of course, because it, their PR team's probably getting paid well because they say, well, if you don't like what you yeah. hear, I'm going to punch you yeah. and I'm going to make you the temperature <laughs> of the sun. So uh, they can smash uh, clamshells and uh, disarm crabs by blowing off their pincers. Now, you've seen a crab and you've seen their oh, pincers yeah. with a mantis shrimp can blow off. Now, I don't know. Now, I don't quite know because I... I didn't bother reading the rest of the article but um when it says blowing off their pincers does it mean it's like giving an underwater breath of air and it's so powerful that it actually blows off the uh, i guess the big question the, the big question is are these mantis shrimp swimming around the coral reefs of australia because this sounds like one of those australian animals like yeah. you know a koala bear a tasmanian devil or all all the bizarro spiders and snakes and everything they have down there i mean what these mantis shrimp uh i'd, I'd kind of like to have a few pets I'd, I'd i'd like to give some his gifts you know and just say hey you know hold him he he, he likes to be held you know give him little kisses right there on the nose and uh, when he reaches out to you and he looks like he's about to punch you that's just his way of showing love well, it, it sounds to me like he's been writing his own kind of Match.com profile or something. Right. It's like, uh, yeah, very handsome crustacean. I have a spring-loaded punching arms. I can strike with over 200 pounds of force. I can heat the water to nearly to the temperature of the sun. I can disarm crabs by blowing off their pincers. 
and oh, so and earns, I, a, earns over one hundred thousand a year, no children. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add that, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so you always do all of our research, but when you brought up this topic, I was thinking to myself, well, I, I, I've got to try to add something. You know, I, I can't be the guy that just doesn't know anything all the time. And so I was thinking about this random fish, right? And of course... Honestly, you know, we talked about some of these crazy animals in, in this evolution thing and what we're halfway through these crazy animals and they're all, you know, ocean-going animals, right? But there's a fish that actually makes its home in the butt of a sea cucumber. Think about that. It, there's a fish that makes its home in the butt of a sea cucumber. Well, you could honestly start to argue, why do we even have sea cucumbers, right? I mean, we don't have sea pickles, but we do have sea cucumbers. But the crazy thing is why they actually do this. And it's because it's worked for one of the crazy ancestors, and it's a winning strategy. But it gets perpetuated by natural selection. Crazy. It's just crazy to think about that. So uh, we've only hit, what what was that, like six, seven animals? I mean, it, you could probably, if, if we actually did, you know, a ton of research, probably dig up even more crazy animals. But they, there are some crazy animals for you to say, well, is evolution really coming along? Is it making things better? How did we evolve into all these crazy animals and, and go off on these spider webs and tangents of all the, the crazy stuff that's going on. Well, I think really we need to shift our focus to the most important uh, part of evolution, that is us, the humans. The, because, the, oh, I thought, yeah. I thought we were going back to the mantis shrimp. No, oh. no. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look him up on YouTube later, though, and I want to see the water. Because obviously if it's heating up the temperature of the sun, surely that's the old ocean immediately evaporated well, there well, now, sorry but, to go back on but, these topics but, yeah but before we get on to humans what if mantis shrimps are the cause of global warming because they're punching everything because they're all upset right now and now because they can punch at the heat of the sun that's why the earth is doing i mean science you're welcome i want no credit for it, it there there's global warming right there all right mantis well, the, shrimps well there can't be more than five of them on the face of the earth though can they honestly oh. because you get more than them like i said i mean you can have to bring in the avengers to defeat them at this point oh, yeah that's true that's an excellent point yeah anyway sorry so uh we're going to shift on uh as i said to the most important part of evolution and that's how it affects humankind because that's because sure. you know animals can go to one thing not many people care if a giraffe originally looked like a chicken right. or a crocodile originally And, of course, last I like checked, uh, when we looked in our analytics of our listeners, we have no mantis shrimps listening to our podcast. No, we don't. Do you think they're edible? I want to eat one. I want to eat one. Yeah, I okay. do too. Right. So anyway, apparently we're humans, and this is kind of a bit of a bleak outlook, really, but science is split between... Uh, a body that believes evolution in humans is pretty much near finished, that natural disaster will actually end uh, humankind before any type of significant evolution takes part that would actually be able to be measured empirically. Um, th and that, you know, when we did our podcast on uh, Come Armageddon Come, basically end of the world scenarios that, you know, naturally through... Um, you know, reoccurring ice ages, asteroids, whatever, that the humankind is going to be wiped out right. once again long before any, you know, new evolutionary features like, oh, we've grown you well, know, an extra it, leg out of our back comes into play. Right, and of course, if, if we're looking at that end times in, in Armageddon or whatever you want to call it, in theory, that is the halting point of evolution because now everything's gone, so obviously it can't evolve anymore. 
Yeah, and so it's it's really uh, transhumanism or biohacking is supposed to be the next step in human evolution. Transhumanism. Transhum. Now, when I first heard that, I thought, "What? So we're going to evolve into a whole species who don't know which bathroom to use?" I don't. No, I mean, I I still struggle with that because yeah. because men's rooms are always supposed to be to the right. Are they? Yeah, and so it if restaurants or places get that confused sometimes i'll just turn to the right and i realize whoops uh i don't see any urinals in this bathroom i must be in the wrong bathroom but, but what it, are those it, bathrooms have two separate and ent- well access points ah uh, so it see, might be on the right for one person and on yeah, the left see, for another. see we need evolution to say we just need one access point we need an entrance and an exit and it could be the same door but we don't need more than one entrance to a restroom that gets confusing it does so yeah basically the theory goes that you know humans can only really evolve now with the assistance of mankind um implants um, you know, altering like, DNA, well, RNA. You're, yeah, and, you're saying artificially or, or scientifically yeah, mm-hmm. uh, with some kind of science involvement. Uh, it's it's not going to happen through the normal course of human events. Right, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we're basically using technology to augment biological capabilities and enhance the human experience. By that, I mean if there was a way to plug an iPhone up your butt and ensure it had a continual power source and it could connect to your brain then your experience of the world of that information was instantly available and you could disseminate between all that information immediately that your life choices would be somewhat better but then does relying on that type of data then overshadow your own personality because it's going to take a very strong person to say oh well I disagree with those 1.6 million pages on the internet that had this viewpoint and I can't find any support in mine. So does right. that then it, stop you being you? Yeah, but but could that be our buddy Elon Musk's, you know, goal with the Neuralink? You know, is that the next point in evolution? Because he wants to be able to put electrodes in your brain. You download an app to your phone and it connects via Bluetooth, and you can access all the data that's on the Internet, you know, right straight to your brain, so you don't have to Google search anything, you don't have to look anything up on Wikipedia, anything like that. He, he wants to be able to feed that, and then also, on the flip side of that, throw your consciousness into some other kind of artificial... Uh, holding cell, whatever you want to call it. I mean, then maybe that's the next stage of evolution. Maybe, maybe that's where we're going. And like you say, it's it's a man-made thing. It's a technology thing. It's a science thing that, that we push ourselves towards that evolutionary-wise. Yeah. And, you know, cyborgs, you know, the mix of, you know, man and machine hasn't traditionally had a good press in sci-fi movies you know right. it's normally you know the worst case scenario yeah. I mean, outs- Bum- bumbling idiot yeah. like c-3po in star wars where he's just a pain and well he R2-D2. was a pure robot he wasn't a cyborg i mean a well, mix of human and machine yeah, no fair enough you know? fair enough you, you're talking about like more synthetics, like robocop well yeah, well yeah well synthetics like in say blade runner or you have um uh, what's the movie i can't remember but yeah basically just um well, actually, no, I was going to talk about the first Alien movie where um, she doesn't trust robots, but that one guy who turned out to be a good guy was actually a kind of synthetic. He was a robot mixed between a... Yeah, well, it's kind of yeah. kind, kind of like, uh, you know, when people are dating, you know, the, uh, the girl goes out there and doesn't trust the bad boy, and next thing you know, she likes the bad boy. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Same thing. I'm just saying. I think the plot lines kind of go in exactly the opposite direction. Oh, them, but oh. it's <laughs> been a long time since I've seen that movie. But you know, I mean, there's obviously, and with good reason, a lot of mistrust about scientists wanting to put chips under your skin. On the one hand, you have the evangelical Christians talking about oh, it being the mark of the beast, right. and all this type of stuff. And yeah, they, what 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 is it? Uh, yeah. I think in the Bible where they say like a mark upon your forehead or something. Yeah, or like on the that. right hand, or yeah. on the right hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be, you know the yeah. barcode thing. Yeah. yeah, people bring out those deals where I I saw there was a bracelet that you can wear now that they're kind of testing 
that hooks up to your phone, but it projects onto your forearm and right. you can swipe up and down yeah. and people are saying, oh, that's the mark of the beast. But that, I mean, there there's people out there that think monster drinks have the mark of the beast right. on them. So, yeah. uh, you know, you, you got to dismiss a lot of that. Yeah. You, you just got to say, oh, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're reaching a little bit. Right. Yeah. Now I'm, um, as I said, I, I'm not a big fan of evolution and if, evolu- if evolution is going to go, this mix of, you know, robotics, AI, and regular humans. Then, and, and mantis shrimp. And mantis shrimp. Where they've got any sense, they'll actually completely redo the entire model. Yeah. Now, you know. <laughs> but, um, like I said, I'm not a big fan of evolution when it comes to natural selection because we have all walked somewhere... Um, whether it be Walmart on a Saturday morning or Walmart on a Sunday morning. Or Walmart on a Saturday night at like one in the morning. Yeah, or Walmart on a Thursday afternoon. But anyway, my point is natural selection, it's it's (laughs) hard to see that really we're at our best point because there is so much diversity in humans between, you know, what we might, judgmentally call a good specimen and not a good specimen that's an excellent but it's, point but it's very difficult to tell that same thing in the animal kingdom you look at other mammals now that might be because we're not the most uh, highly respected scientists in the world and perhaps people can look at different mammals and actually see that oh that one's not got plump enough hips so it's probably right. only going to live a year and a half so. well and, and maybe that's why science actually is saying how intelligent dolphins are right you know maybe maybe dolphins they, they always put dolphins below us right but what if dolphins were actually smarter than us and they've got it all figured out and like look at those morons up there doing all this stuff and and dolphins are the ones that have it figured out i mean it, maybe Maybe the ones that get captured and turn into the, and I I hate to use the term circus performers, but, you know, the performing dolphins, you swim with the dolphins, and they're the ones that jump up and and they do everything. They're the ones of the sideshow days back in the Barnum and Bailey days, and and they're just kind of the dumb ones, right? Right. But the smart ones are the ones we haven't even seen. I mean, maybe maybe you got a dolphin colony that's living in the bottom of the ocean, right? And they're swimming around, and they've got mantis shrimp cooking chicken for them, and they're just hanging out, and they're having a grand old time, and they're living life, and then they're loving life. And we're the dumb ones. Maybe maybe dolphins are the number one. And so by that rationale, that could disprove evolution because dolphins can't hop out of the ocean and walk around and do what we do, but maybe they've got it all figured out and we don't. Well, if you look at, I think if you ask most people, you know, what the point of life is or what they would like to achieve in their life, they would say to be happy. And our life is so complex in terms of the variety of jobs we do or the needs or wants we try to fulfill. But what if dolphins are absolutely, completely happy with their life, that they're mating, um, you know, eating... They're they're surviving. Yeah, uh, torturing the occasional porpoise and taking part in gang rape, um, which which I just want to say is actually characteristics of dolphins. They can be a-holes. Yeah, but it, look at uh, remember when the the tuna industry had to put all the stuff on their cans about you know this is dolphin safe right. tuna. Yeah. What if the dolphins got mad at us about that? Like, look, we figured out what y'all are doing and catching this tuna, and we were taking the outcasts of our dolphin yeah. community, yeah. and we were throwing them in these yeah. nets. Pedophiles. And, yeah. and, and now we don't have a way to get rid of them because we were relying on you guys, and now you said, oh, now we have these dolphin-safe nets. Like, you know, help us out here. I mean, we, we send our outcasts to go do your SeaWorld shows. We were trying to get rid of the really bad ones that were kind of dumb that couldn't do the SeaWorld tricks, and we were throwing them in the nets so we get rid of those, and now the dolphins are getting all mad at us and saying, you yeah, know, Come on, man. Just help us out here a little bit. Is um 
that dolphin to English uh, app available on the new iOS? Oh, uh, no, that comes out at 15. Oh, okay. uh, we're, we're on 14 yeah. right now. It comes out in 15. Right. Okay. That, that's what I heard. I just want to clarify that one. Uh, we have insider information that, right. yes, that, that's coming out at iOS 15. Okay. Uh, Android folks, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, now, I think animals, for the most part, again, based upon our scientific viewpoint, have done pretty well out of evolution. Again, you know, there's some of them we question whether they should be existing or not because we can't see the point of them. And there are others which, you know, are just plain funny to look at, but they get the job done. Sure. Um, And a lot of those really ugly fish and insects and stuff are actually blind. So, Mm. you know, love love is blind, so it doesn't doesn't really matter. But um, going back to humans, I think we've got the rough rough kind of deal of evolution a bit because some of these things i think should have dropped off the charts you know about half a million years ago a million oh, years probably ago so, yeah. you know i don't understand why we've still got these things going on um and you know one, one of the few uh things which people feel they have a need for on their body is the little toe Oh, right. the baby toe. Because other than cramming it against stuff and learning how to cuss well, in four different languages, yeah, it's not... but it is the the one that went wee 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 all the way home. Yeah, yeah. But um, apparently, it's absolutely crucial to helping you maintain your balance. If you take it really? away, it can affect your balance up to thirty to forty percent. Wow. So why is it always the one that gets stubbed on the furniture when you're walking around at night and you say, you know what, I need a glass of water. And it's always the one that just makes you wake up everybody in the house whenever you, yeah. you know, snag it on a piece of furniture. Yeah, I mean, for something that small, it's got a lot of responsibility in helping you maintain its balance. But um, I did read uh, that its effectiveness is thwarted pretty well by alcohol. Ah, no <laughs> kidding. Well, so it's the, the alcoholic of the five toes. I mean, yeah. you know, one in five people that drink is the uh, alcoholic. So, I mean, that makes kind of sense. Yeah. Uh, and I did research that fact. Uh, you don't have to look that up. Yeah. Now, now I, I'm actually a fan of just having the two giant big toes on one foot instead of these five individual toes. Oh, almost like a duck foot. You know, they, they've got the, the three that's sticking out yeah, there. Yeah, but, but they're webs. But yeah, yeah, but but you're saying two, just just, just two. like two giant toes. Yeah, on just each two foot. giant toes. Yeah, oh. I think that'll get the job done. Well, it, you'd probably get the toenail clipper manufacturers really upset because now toenail clippers are going to last. Don't need, about, don't need toenails. Oh, see now now you're getting off on a little yeah. tangent there. Yeah. I mean, so so now that the nails are going away, so now you're putting the toenail manufact or the toenail clipper manufacturers out of business. And now you're going to have to take all the shoe manufacturers and say, hey, we got to redo these shoes. Yeah. You're causing all kinds of problems. Well, I You're d- causing all kinds well, of problems with this line of thought. Well, yeah. You didn't even mention the shoe industry you might have a bit of an issue of it, especially with the like, ladies' shoes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, can, can you imagine how goofy those shoes would look with two toes? I mean, do you, do you point them all together or do you separate them out? And then does it become some kind of a attraction of the gap between your two toes? Is it a close gap or is it a far gap? Well, it, I'll tell you one thing. It's going to ruin the whole uh, foot fetish phenomenon out there because there's nothing going to be worse than seeing a really kind of sexy lady's shoe and then two big toes stuck in it. Yeah, and, and are the toes equal size I don't know. Yeah, because I thought about what, that. What, because what if? What do you think would what, be the prettiest combination? Well, yeah, but but what if the attractiveness is both toes are equal size, and then you end up with one toe a little bit smaller than the other toe, yeah. and now you're ostracized, yeah. and now you're like, well, but you know who it could actually help is plastic surgeons, because now they're going to put toe implants in to make sure that both toes are equal size if yeah. that's what's attractive. Yeah. Conversely, if one of those toes has to be a little smaller and you have toes of equal size, plastic surgery right. again. So once again, medicine wins, plastic surgery wins. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know when I originally thought of that idea what my kind of time scale was for it to come in, but I haven't read up on um, evolution. I think 
you and I might be dead before even one okay. giant big toe kind of like oh, yeah. starts growing I, huge. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> I, I don't want to see that. Now, I mean, one famous uh, discard from evolution was obviously we lost our tails at some point in time, right. at least as far as evolutionary theory goes. I mean, there are other theories about why we have the Cossack's bone. Right. Um, but the main one is because we had a tail. Yeah. And uh, we've actually lost our tails twice no kidding. during evolution. There were two separate times, apparently, our lineage of humans had tails, and we, loth- we managed to lose them both times. Evolution decided they don't want no them. No more tail. Now, okay. I think it's because humans are as mean as crap, and they were probably just pulling them a lot and cutting them off. And evolution just thought this is... Well, and it, it, it could go back to a uh, cosmetic thing that, uh, you know, you remove the tail. I mean, there there's things that we do as humans. That something as simple as cutting our hair, right? If you think about that, most people cut their hair. I mean, there, there are a handful of uh, religious groups and other ethnic groups that don't ever cut their hair, but we do cut our hair. And then now we've gotten into uh, socially acceptability of baldness in men. You know, if your hairline starts receding, used to, you'd look at somebody that shaved their head, and you'd say, oh, they're a skinhead or something like that. Now it's attractive. So we've always altered our appearance, but that's a little extreme if you're cutting off a body part. Now, would you like a tail if you had the choice? No. No. I would not want a tail. Why? I have a hard enough time finding jeans that fit correctly, and then if I've got to worry about another measurement on there besides the length and the waist <laughs> of where the, the <laughs> tail's going to go bangers. in, I mean, that's why I buy jeans once every five years, and once I find a pair that fits, I go in, I buy five pairs of those, and I'm like, I'm good for another half a decade because I don't want to have to go buy jeans anymore. So if I if I had to worry about, especially if my tail is going to grow or maybe shrivel up a little bit as I get older, or maybe my my tail's got some hair on it, now I got to shave my tail, uh, too much too much hassle, too too much too much responsibility. Don't want to deal with that. Right. Okay. We'll uh, cross that one off the list then of things we don't want back. Um, now, uh, what I was absolutely amazed to discover and i actually heard this uh back on a joe rogan podcast a few months ago that the eye is actually considered part of the brain right it is the only visible part of the brain but it is actually a legitimate for all intents and purposes part of the brain makes sense yeah, i mean it, that that's one of those of course the core five senses uh depending on where you're at in science you know we have several senses beyond the main core five senses but you know, sight is obviously very important to humans. Right. Uh, most of what we look at and, and see, even there you go. Once we look at, we, we even delineate that towards sight. But we're so reliant upon sight, especially in this evolutionary process that we have now. I mean, you're listening to this right now, but most of what we do is through sight and hearing. Uh, touch, taste... Not as important, but sight, super important. Hmm. Now, uh, if evolution could improve upon the eyes, okay, and say it had, I don't know, another billion years or so to work this out, how do you think it could improve on the eye in terms of spacing, size, just, you know, uh, less sensitivity to bright light? better night well, vision. Well, I, I think you could you could put sunglasses out of business, you know, if you could actually get your eyes to not be affected by the sunlight where we all want to wear sunglasses. And, of course, there's people out there that never wear sunglasses. They say, oh, that doesn't bother me. Uh, if you could get it to where you didn't have any degeneration in your eyesight, so if you were able to evolve your eyes to where people didn't need glasses or contacts, that'd be good. Getting rid of color blindness, uh, you know, I'm colorblind, so that's a problem for me. So that'd be a nice evolution that we got rid of that. But if you could detect things with your eyes, like if someone's sick, 
and you could see the fact that they had a fever. Because we have these new thermometers now that you don't even have to touch the person. You shoot a little laser, you hit them on the head, uh, you know, right there on their forehead, and it says, here's the temperature. If you could imagine being able to walk around and you could see kind of a, uh, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, the thermographic, I don't think that's right, but you can see, you know, heat signatures and everything. If you could actually look at a person and know whether or not they had a fever, you would know to stay away from them. Right. You would know that they have some kind of infection. So if you could look at a person and say, that person's sick, yeah. Even though they could hide the fact that they had symptoms. Yeah. Maybe they're not coughing. Maybe they're not sneezing. Yeah. Maybe they're not sweaty or clammy. But you could look at a person and say, that person's sick. I'm going to stay away from them. That could be an evolution yeah. to where we could be a healthier society. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, well I, obviously in the animal kingdom, that ability exists to a point because you have dogs which can sniff cancer. They can sniff various you know, diseases. Right. And obviously... You know, in in other parts of the animal kingdom, they can tell who the sick are, and it's obviously not just well. It might be based upon some types of op, some type of observation, but whether it be smell or something that they can tell when other animals are sick, I just don't think that might be one of those things that we have lost or that we never had. Right. So so now going back to the survival of the fittest or whatever, if we did have that at one time and we lost that olfactory sense of being able to smell whether or not somebody has cancer, somebody has a disease, somebody's sick, we obviously didn't make any progress in the right direction there because that would right. have been great. And, and you were mentioning eyes, but smell would be the same way. Uh, you know, Sight, hearing, maybe there's a tremulation in a voice or yeah. something like that, that you could detect that. Yeah. Maybe we had it at one time, maybe we lost it. And so that would be a negative on the comment, or on the column, rather, of evolution. Right. Because maybe at one time we realized that's a healthy person, yeah. that's a sick person. Yeah. I want to be with the healthy person, not yeah. the sick person. Yeah. But evolution, you know, also through natural selection comes to a point where overpopulation can kill off a species or drastically reduce a species numbers. Sure. So, you know, all of these things which evolution could have given us or another animal that you can't make an animal kind of like super animal or make us superhuman because right. if we become almost indestructible, then the species obviously overpopulates and every species overpopulates because everything becomes impossible to kill. Right. You know, carnivores die off because they can't actually eat yeah. anything. We, we, we get rid Plant, of all of yeah, our natural plants, resources. Plants develop all these yeah. spikes on it. And so, you know, the herbivores can't eat. See, I get that. Now, um, <laughs> which led me to wonder, in terms of the eyes, okay, being part of the brain, okay, would you ever see that the cyclops eye, that one eye in the middle of your forehead, that big eye, would be a better way to go than the two? Oh, I think so. In front of you? I, I think we need one eye. I don't think we need two, because everybody has a strong eye and a weak eye. Uh, I don't, and of course I've fact checked this like crazy, like we do everything. But everybody has a strong eye and a weak eye. And I remember there being tests, you know, you cover this eye and then you cover the other eye and you focus on one thing and you can always figure out what your right. dominant eye is. Yeah. So if you have a dominant eye, why don't you just have one eye? Right. Why can't we just have <laughs> one eye? And of course, yeah. I think a lot of that goes back to symmetry and what is considered right. uh, attractive or whatever. But maybe if we just got rid of the two eyes and we just went to one eye, but of course... There's uh, several people, and I can't think of the dude's name. He's in Congress right now. He's got the eye patch on. Dan Crenshaw. Uh, yeah, Dan Crenshaw. You know, poor guy, if he only had one eye and he lost that eye, now he can't see. At least he's got one eye. So right. so maybe it's one of those, you know, hey, if you lose one, you got a spare. Right. So uh, I, I get that part. But if we had some way to protect that eye and maybe make it invincible, right. now you only need one. Right. So we've just got to grow one invincible giant one, eye on our One forehead. invincible giant yeah, eye. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I, I, did, it, I did actually kind of want to find out 
why one eye wouldn't work as well as two eyes if the one eye was big enough and had a few you know genetic modifications to sure. it but instead i kind of got drawn in you know on google where it comes up with the most popular ask questions about right. topic so i typed in cyclops and um uh compared to you know dual vision or whatever anyway so these are the questions i got asked up do cyclops eat humans uh i would have to say no they do apparently oh yeah. well yeah yeah i don't think the one eye is directly responsible no probably not um Here's one, which, uh, <laughs> how many eyes does a Cyclops have? <laughs> Six. Um, there's one who is very concerned about the Cyclops history. Uh, what did the Cyclops do? Now, I didn't know whether it meant like job, hobbies, or... Yeah, it, you know, it, it fished in the morning and played the guitar in the evening. I mean, it, I, I, yeah. don't, I don't get where that one's going. Well, well I felt you know, what the most pertinent question was about the Cyclops, and I'm glad they asked this one, was, uh, are Cyclops fireproof? I would have to go with no. Yes, they are. Oh, yeah. 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 See? See, you know nothing about I Cyclops. Know, I, I, now you know I, something about Cyclops. I, I now have a couple of facts about Cyclops, right. so I, I can die happy. Right, well, just to kind of end up, here really i do have a l short wish list okay okay all right let's hear your wish My short list. wish list um for evolution if humankind can keep going you know the next right. x number of million of years for this to actually yeah, yeah. Happen. what 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 can we make happen in the right. betterment of evolution i would like an extra arm or maybe two for aesthetical issues so oh. about four now is this in case you lose one or no. are you looking for like a general Just grievous kind of deal with the extra arms for well, more lightsabers i mean wait what why do you want extra arms well i'm thinking at that point in time when evolution gets there think of what model of xbox we're going to be on then and how complex those controllers are going to be you're going to need three hands you, minimum yeah, on one you, controller you, you almost need that i mean what what was the nintendo that came out that had that goofy controller that it, you could never figure out exactly how to hold it the uh, wii one no no no, no. before one? that it, it was oh, after the end I, I think it was after the n64 but remember it it was oh, it, yeah. it, it had the little deal in the middle the game, not the gamecube controller so i know I the one i know the one you mean yeah but yeah. the stick was right in the middle so right in the middle if yeah. you didn't have a long thumb you were screwed exactly yeah all right so so for video but, game purposes ah uh, okay yeah uh, i can get that i, I think right. two because what it looks stupid with one yeah yeah and so we got of four course, arms total no no we're going back to symmetry because yeah. where do you yeah. put that third arm? Yeah. So, okay, I'm with you. Yeah. Four arms. Four right. arms. I'd like to uh, see an update on the whole toes situation, see if yep. we can't work. Uh, we've been over that. I, 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 right. I know you have a problem with the toes. Yep. And I think there should be a uh, try out for Cyclops one eye on a 30-day trial basis. If you don't like it, you can go back to two original eyes. I'm sure there is a plastic surgeon somewhere in California that can probably you know, set that up for you. I, I'm almost certain. Or or there's somebody in secret saying, mm -hmm. you know what, I think I might be able to make this happen. Yeah. I, I'm just waiting for the right person to come along and say, you know what, here's what I want. Here's what I want. So, so some scientists believe that human evolution is far from over and suggest women will become shorter and stouter. That is... That one, to me, just completely blows my mind, especially with high heels. I mean, let, let's think about high heels just right off the bat because it's always about women wanting to look a bit taller. Actually, if you look in history, men actually used to wear heels as well. Everybody wanted to look taller, but maybe we're getting to the point to where we've reached that pinnacle of height, and now we want to turn around and be shorter. You know, now we don't have to build our houses as taller, our cars as taller, things like that. I don't know if I buy into the whole, you know, shorter and stouter thing. But this is just women, not men. So the women are going to grow shorter and stouter, so more kind of beach ball shaped, which I think personally is going to address the uh, overpopulation issue. 
Well, it, it very well <laughs> could be because it, as we all know that uh, men evolve a heck of a lot slower than women do. So we're, we're going to have to go a few generations there. And if they want to get that way, then we'll whittle down the population and right. let the whole survival yeah. of the fittest go ahead yeah. and take hold. So thanks for tuning into this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. We certainly appreciate everything that y'all have done for us and all of your listens. And we'll catch you next time.